You may be seated. And as you're being seated, uh, I'm going to ask uh, those in the lobby to make their way in. We're going to um, go ahead and jump into the text. I'm going to start this morning by the reading of Scripture. And uh, we're going to look to Scripture this morning. We've got a, a large chunk of the text, but I think we're going to move through it quickly. And so I want to invite you to look at Mark chapter 3 with me. Mark chapter 3. We're going to continue in our study today. I'm going to read for you verses 7 through 19. Verses 7 through 19, you have it in your scripture, in your in your Bible, you have it in your handout, it's on the screen, it's all over the place in front of you. I hope you'll take advantage of that today as we look to God's Word. I'm going to start in verse 7, I'm going to read all the way through verse 19, this is our text today, as we see Jesus the faithful minister today, Jesus the faithful minister in Mark's Gospel. This is God's Word, verse 7 of Mark 3. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues and unclean spirits. When they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him and he ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James. And he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. And they went into the house. The book of Mark is, in just a few chapters, has given us a rather incredible picture of the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm curious, I wonder if over the last uh, several months you have seen this portrait of Christ that's being painted for us. Mark is giving us this portrait. He's painting it, if you will, by revealing who Jesus is. And amongst many other descriptions we've already seen, Jesus is the Lord of heaven. He's the King of all kings. He is God's Son in whom the Father is well pleased. And Mark reveals who Jesus is by not just giving us descriptors, but by showing us who he's showing us who Jesus is by showing us what Jesus does. What Jesus does. There's nobody like Jesus. Nobody. And the first two chapters, and now in through the the six chap the six verses of uh, the first six verses of Mark that we saw last week, have shown us the person, the character, and the ministry of Jesus. We're being confronted with this intensely. And if the end of chapter 1 through the beginning of chapter 3 has shown us anything about Jesus, it is that needy people wanted Christ. Don't miss this. Needy people wanted Jesus. Religious people hated Jesus. Needy people want Jesus. Religious people hated Him. I, I want to ask you this morning, are you the needy one? Are you the needy one that wants Jesus? Or are you the, are you the religious one? I appreciate one of the Gians loving Jesus this morning. Are you the religious, you know, you don't take yourself too seriously in a church. The kids just help you to stay humble, don't they? The religious one, are you the religious one today who's trying to please God by your list keeping? 
your rule focus, your tradition honoring. If I'm honest with you this morning, I stand up here as somebody who reverts to works easily. I revert to standards, to giving. I I revert often to my pastoral work as the grounds for God's acceptance of me. But we have seen over these last few weeks as we looked at Jesus in the Sabbath, we have seen that Jesus is actually unburdening us from the pressure that we find to find to gain acceptance with God. Jesus is unburdening us from that pressure. He unburdens us from the traditions that add extra weight to our Christian lives. Nothing that we have said is to say that Jesus doesn't care about our holiness, that Jesus doesn't care about how we live. Jesus unburdens us from the extra-biblical traditions that often find their way into the lives of Christians. And for the all-elusive joy and rest that we so desperately long for, Jesus comes And He gives it to us freely. He says to all, Come unto Me all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, not a list, not more to do, I will give you rest. Weary hearts, needy people need a Savior who gives rest. He doesn't give it to us because of our striving, but He gives it to us because of our ceasing. He doesn't give it to us because of our working, but by our trusting He doesn't give it to us because we climb to Him. He gives it rest to us because we fall into His arms as needy people. And this has been the heart of Mark's narrative for the last few weeks, hasn't it? Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. But it has to be stated again and again and again that the religious people, the Pharisees, do nothing but have conflict with Jesus for what He claimed, for what He did, for what He taught. There's a constant conflict, and we saw that for these last several weeks. We saw these five conflicts. And it got so bad last week that the Pharisees, they found an unlikely alliance, didn't they? You know, world history is full of these weird alliances being made that you look and you go, how did those two countries get together? Here in in Mark, it's the Pharisees and the Herodians, the the legalistic, law-keeping religious Pharisees and the irreligious, Herod-worshipping, Rome-worshipping Herodians who now we saw in Mark 3, 6, they come together because they want to destroy Jesus, as you'll see there. They want to destroy Jesus. The religious and the irreligious. The Pharisees hated Jesus because they believed that He stood in opposition to the law of God and to the tradition of the Pharisees. Well, he didn't stand in opposition to the law, but he did stand in opposition to their extra-biblical traditions. The Herodians, they hated Jesus because he they thought that he was an affront to Herod. Herodians, they're Herod followers. And they had no king but Herod, and Jesus was an affront to that because he is the king of kings. He is the king over Herod. They didn't like him for that. And so they wanted to destroy him. Now let me just be clear about this. Because we're only in Mark 3. We're not going to the cross. Jesus is not going to the cross yet. But Jesus is all-knowing and even in His awareness and His humanness, He is understanding that He needs to perceive that they want to destroy Him. And so the text today tells us that Jesus withdraws Himself. He withdraws Himself. I want you to see three, three aspects of the text and try to work hard with me, all right? This is, I know you've worked hard all week, but on Sunday I want you to work hard with God, okay? Will you do that with me? I want you to see number one. I want you to see in this text the popularity of Jesus. The popularity of Jesus. Knowing the harm that the Pharisees and the Herodians were going to bring, and knowing that Jesus' hour for suffering on the cross was not yet come, I want you to see in verse 7 what he did. He withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. A great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea, from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. The second time, we see that, a great multitude. And they heard, notice the the words here, they heard what great things He did. Those people came unto Him, 
He spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. Let me make a few points here of observation for us because we want to interrogate and observe the text for a moment here. A few points to make. Number one, Jesus withdrew with his disciples. This is an unknown group at this point. In verse 7, we don't know who this is. It's an un, We're going to find out, obviously, today. We're going to see that list, as we already saw. But the, the language of disciple, he withdrew with the learners. That's what disciple means, a learner. It speaks of those who moved from an attending an interest meeting, if you will. They had moved from simple intrigue of Jesus to being learners of Jesus. They were committed followers. They were not following Jesus because of intrigue, but he was their teacher. He was their teacher. By the way, just because someone was a disciple doesn't mean that they would always be a disciple. Did you catch that in the text? At the end of our reading, did you see the name that was given? Judas Iscariot, right? Well, John 6 also tells us in verse 66 that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So just because somebody was a disciple in this moment doesn't mean they would always be a learner of Jesus of Nazareth. Second observation in the text is not just that Jesus withdrew with a specific people, but twice we're told that a great multitude followed him. I emphasize that as I read it. When you read the Bible, you want to look for some of these kind of repeating phrases. A great multitude, a great multitude. He did great things. The description of a great multitude is sandwiching the locations from which the people had come. Now the language of great indicates, seems to indicate, that the size of the crowd, many scholars, whether you care what scholars think or not, have argued that we're probably talking thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. I don't want to be dogmatic about that, but a great multitude. I don't know how many it is. It's a lot. But they come from a variety of locations. The text tells us they, they had come from, uh, from uh, for, well, we're going to get into that in a moment, but from all over that region. And so I don't want you to miss the, the crowd. I want you to remember this, though, in Mark 1. Remember when Jesus was healing the leper? Mark 1, 45, he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Literally, Mark 3 tells us the corners from where they came from. The, 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 the ministry of Jesus was so significant in this moment that he could not enter into the city. They had to come out to him. And I want you to notice from where all the people came. Thirdly, in verse 7, we see the list. They came from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, from Beyond Jordan, they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, and they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. Now you got to understand, this is not like, you know, Ravenswood and Lincoln Square and people are coming from, from Albany Park and from Uptown and from LP Lincoln Park. They're, this is not what we're talking about here. I mean, from Galilee to Jerusalem alone, if we were to drive it, and if you come with me to Israel, hint, hint, you should come with me to Israel. If you came with me to Israel, you see, it's about a two and a half hour drive from, Israel, from, from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee. This region was Galilee, which was nearby, from Judea, which is the region around Jerusalem, from Jerusalem itself. The people had come from beyond the Jordan, east of Galilee, from Idumea, which is farther south of Judea itself, and from Tyre and Sidon, which is northwest of Galilee. And by the way, Tyre and Sidon was predominantly a Gentile region. Jesus' fame had spread abroad. They were coming from every quarter, as Mark 1 said. Here's popularity here with Jesus. His fame had spread abroad so incredibly that even King Herod heard about Jesus' fame. In Matthew 14 and verse 1, we find at that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. You imagine a movement so great that the regional Roman appointed king knew of him, heard of him, but while the crowd is impressive, and you might and I might be tempted to be impressed by large crowds. 
the danger that we see in this text is to think that everyone who everyone here who knew uh, who Jesus was that they actually had become true disciples of Christ. And verse 8 tells us that they came to Christ because of the great things that He did. They, because of the great things He did. Now there's so much I can flesh out for you here if I had time. Well, let's just pause for a moment and say, many are guilty of coming to Jesus even today because He does great things. They're not interested in being disciples. Not interested in being disciples. See that moment. text tells us here that Jesus did not want him want them to throng him that a word that we don't use often literally means to crush him they were mobbing him if you will he's it's not that Jesus is too good for them it's not that he's a a celebrity preacher it's that Jesus doesn't want to be mobbed and crushed and fallen on and so in a practical way he says to the disciples hey get a small ship and, 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 and have it waiting because of the multitude. And so Jesus would often go out onto a ship. In fact, Mark 4, verse 1 tells us that, that He began to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto Him a great multitude again. So He entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And so what Mark 4 shows us is that what He requested in Mark 3 is a ship and that Jesus would act on this. And so here it is in this imagery that we have in front of us. Jesus teaching a large crowd. A great multitude. Let me say it again. Let's be clear. Being enamored by Jesus or interested in Jesus does not equal salvation. Being enamored by Jesus does not make one a Christian. Being enamored or intrigued by Jesus does not make one a disciple. And it is good, it is very good when people show interest in the Son of God. It is even better when people express faith in the finished work of Christ and follow Jesus as disciple. That's the very reason our church exists. Is that all people would be, become disciples of Christ. So here we see in this text, a large crowd had come because of the nature of his ministry. And it's growing, it's a growing ministry in popularity because of what we see secondly here. Secondly, I want you to see the power and the authority of Jesus. The power and the authority of Jesus. We've this has been a repeated phrase, a repeated picture in Mark's gospel already, but I don't want us to miss it again today. Verse 10 says, For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him. It's that language of thronging. They pressed upon him for to touch him. As many as had plagues. You see, Jesus' ministry had largely been promoted by His miracle. Namely, here, the miracle of healing. The use of the word plague is interesting because if we're thinking biblically, we might take our mind back to Egypt when God had sent plagues to Pharaoh in Egypt, right? And had said, Moses had said, let my people go. Well, now there is a a plague, if you will, that has come upon people, some misfortune, and they have come to the only person that they believe can heal them. They just are okay if all they can do is touch Jesus. We've seen that in the Gospels, haven't we? Where somebody says, they just want to touch Him. There's power in this man. I can just touch the authoritative Son of God. Verse 11 says, And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. An interesting play on words in this text. Mark says that the people pressed upon Jesus, but the unclean spirits, they fell. It's a Markan picture here of contradiction. The people pressed on Jesus, but the unclean demonic spirits, they fall down before Jesus. The, the people didn't fully grasp who Jesus was, but the demonic spirits knew who Jesus was. The truth is, you don't have to press yourself onto Jesus, but Jesus does call us to fall before Him. And He is. And here they 
the unclean spirits, they know his identity. And Jesus imposes his authority over the unclean spirits. By the way, let's remember, it is the word of God that prevails over both the natural and the demonic forces of this world. My friends, let me say it to you. There is power in the word of God. Power in the word of God. And when Jesus speaks, these spirits listen. Can I tell you the answer today? The answer, mom and dad, the answer in your home, the answer for your children, the answer for my children, the answer for your grandchildren, the answer for your marriage is still the word of God. Jesus here rebukes the unclean spirits. Similar to what we find in Psalm 106, 9. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. In the same way as the Red Sea is rebuked, Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit. Power in the word. The authority in the words of Jesus is the same power that we have in the very words of Scripture. And here Jesus commands these unclean spirits not to make him known. I already told you why. There's several reasons we will see this throughout Mark's study, but let me just say it again to you today. Jesus needs no promotion from Satan. He doesn't need Satan to promote him. So when he rebukes the unclean spirits and says, be quiet, don't you dare make known who I am. You're not, Satan, you and your minions are not speaking for me. That's what Jesus says. Rebuking them. And when Jesus rebukes them, they obey and they be quiet. They don't argue. Jesus is Lord over the spirit realm as well. Now, in all of Mark's account up to this point, listen, only the Father, and you gotta, you gotta catch this because it's so it's so intriguing. In Mark's account, from Mark, Mark 1 all the way through the middle of Mark 3, the only people who recognize the true identity of Jesus is the Father who says, This is my beloved Son. And now twice demonic spirits who said, you are the Son of God. The Father and the unclean spirits at this point. I want to ask you this morning, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Let me take that question further. Do you submit to the ruler, the the heavenly ruler, the sovereign ruler? Do you submit to the Lord of heaven? Jesus Christ today? When He speaks, do you obey Him? Number three, I want you to see the partners of Jesus. The partners of Jesus. Look at verse 13. Let's look at this one more time. And He goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto Him whom He would. And they came unto Him and He ordained twelve that they should be with Him and that He might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Now listen very carefully. We want to make sure I pause there for a moment. I want to make sure that we're not misconstruing the point of this text. Jesus is choosing here, listen very carefully, He is choosing an inner circle. This is not speaking of choosing in salvation. He's choosing an inner circle. We have to grasp that because Even Judas being on the list speaks of this. He's inviting into his life these 12. It speaks of discipleship. Now, on this earth, Jesus has an inner circle. It is these 12. We know the. we're not going to get so much into Judas today. We're not even going to get into specifics about the 12. But these 12 are the foundation of this new movement, this new kingdom that has started. The king has come. And he's called, if you will, he's called the twelve. A a, a a picture of a failing Israel, an unbelieving Israel, and the foundation of the new movement in and through these twelve. Notice who they are. Simon, he's surnamed Peter, James the son of Zebedee, John the brother of James, and he surnamed them, I've been struggling with this word all week, Boanerges which is the Sons of Thunder, best nickname in all of Scripture, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus 
and Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. And they went into a house. Luke chapter 6 gives us the same list in a, just a different way. Can I just say, can I stop for just a moment, though, and say this to you? Almost everybody in this room probably knows who Simon Peter is. And you probably know who John is and who James is. And you probably know who Andrew is. And you probably even know who Thomas is, but you probably call him Doubting Thomas. But you know what you probably don't know? Where's Alpheus going? Right? Where, where did Bartholomew go? What about, what about Thaddeus? What about Simon the King? Like all of this, where did they go? And here's, let me just stop here and say, in the, in the, the, the realm of Jesus and his people, listen, there are Simons and there are Johns and there are also Bartholomews. There are those that are known and those that are lesser known, and every one of them has value to the purpose of God. Maybe you're here today and you just think, I'm just a mom who's trying to raise her kids for the glory of God. Nobody really knows me. Wonderful. Wonderful. Be okay. Just be on the list. Just be okay being who God has called you to be. The appointment of the twelve is significant, and unfortunately, for time's sake, I'm not going to get into why Jesus calls the twelve today. There'll be other times for that. I wish I could take you through and teach you something intriguing and interesting and enjoyable about every one of the twelve in this text. If you enjoy a study like that, uh, there's books about that, but today that's not the day for it. But let me just say, Jesus is choosing twelve men. They're not religious leaders, they're laymen. They're fishermen the tax collectors. We don't know many of the others' occupation. They're not religious leaders. Not a one of them, as far as we're aware. So in choosing these 12 laymen, Jesus is rebuking the entire system of Judaism. He's rebuking the Sadducees and the Pharisees and even the progressive secularistic Herodians. These leaders had been removed. They were being removed and replaced And this is what Jesus is doing. He's bringing in this new usher, this new moment. He's ushering in this new kingdom. And for Mark's Gentile audience, it's a reminder to them that salvation had come through the Jewish people in the words of Paul to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And so Jesus' own apostles are showing this. But you got to understand, these 12 didn't apply. There's no resume presented here. They weren't standing at the door of Peter's house saying to Jesus, do you have room for me? The text says that Jesus chose them. Well, John says that as well in his gospel in John 15. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, speaking to the twelve, speaking of discipleship, that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of my of the Father in my name, He may give it to you. Jesus chose them for a reason. Again, for time. I wanna, I'm going to avoid getting into some of the nuance here and some of the intricacies of this. And I want to lead us to, I think, what is a simple application. Often I give you two, maybe three applications. Today I want to I want to simplify this, but I think I have to flesh it out for a few moments, so bear with me. And then I hope I can help you make your lunch over there, okay? These verses here, verses 7 and 19, we've run through them quickly, give us what might be the most significant or one of the most helpful overviews of the ministry of Jesus. More is coming. There's teaching, there's miracles coming. But what Mark is doing is showing us, showing all of us, the faithful ministry of Jesus. I'm I'm honored that anybody would ever remember my ministry. My ministry, unfortunately, is not always faithful. Because I'm a sinner. I fall short. I will fail you. I will let you down. I might even unintentionally hurt you. 
Such is the way often in the Christian life. It's impossible to be a part of the Lord's church and not be hurt at times. So what is Mark showing us? He's showing us that Jesus is the faithful minister. His ministry is always faithful and for us. But in this verse, the faithful minister calls people to be with him, to be taught by him. The multitude is pressing on Jesus, but there's a contrast here. There's a pressing multitude, and there's Jesus withdrawing with disciples. The unclean spirits have awareness for who Jesus is. They respect who Jesus is, but the multitude does not. But inside all of this, there's a small group, there's an inner circle, and they are called to be apostles. Jesus coins a term for them. They are uh, disciples, and Jesus calls them his apostles, his sent ones. You've got to understand, you got to understand that in the first century Judaism, rabbis did not call. Try to stay with me. Rabbis did not call followers. They didn't call followers. Rabbis were chosen by their disciples. They were chosen by their disciples because a, a rabbi would never call them and say, you need to follow me, you need to be a part of my inner circle, because it would insinuate in doing so they believed that the rabbi was placing himself above the Torah. But the rabbi instead was chosen by the student because the student wanted to see the rabbi as a as the tutor, if you will, the teacher, as a means of mastering the Torah. The rabbi became an example of what the student could become. All right, so stay with me for just this. I don't want you to miss it. So when Jesus calls the disciples, Jesus is operating from a different framework. He is claiming that not even the Torah, or if you will, God himself is more important than Jesus, for he is God, and the Torah comes from him and is fulfilled by him. And so unlike the rabbis in Judaism, Jesus is not a means to an end. Don't miss that. Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is not a means to an end, whether it's for the law or whether it's to get out of hell. He's not a means to an end. Jesus is. He is our teacher. He is our master. He is our, if you want, our rabbi. He is our Lord. He is our king. And so, why does Jesus call disciples? Why does he call the 12 apostles? And why is he saying to us, listen, why is he saying to every Christian in the room today, to every person here, why is Jesus calling us? He has chosen us as well to participate in discipleship. He has chosen his people to be with him, to be like him, not as a means to an end, but to make something of us. Jesus is interested in making something of his disciples, not seeing what they can make of themselves to be on their own. Here's the quote that I don't want you to miss that will lead us to a key point for our text. Being, of a disciple, being a disciple of Jesus is to be formed by Jesus, to be like Jesus by being with Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus is to be formed by Jesus. To be like Jesus by being with Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. I, I want to ask you this morning. I've asked you questions already. I ask you though again: Are you a learner of Jesus, the Son of God? Are you a disciple? Are you being? formed by Jesus, to be like Jesus by being with Jesus. And here's the point now. If you say, I am, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. Discipleship is relational, verbal, and behavioral. Beha behavioral. Relational, verbal, behavioral. I want you to look at verse 13 and into verse 15. And he goes up into a, high, into a mountain and calls unto him, whom he would, and they came unto him. This is speaking of the twelve and the ordained twelve. Notice these, notice these words. 
but they should be with him. And that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Relational, verbal, and behavioral. To be a disciple of Jesus, if you say, I want to be a disciple of Christ, I see myself as a disciple of Christ, then you have to ask yourself whether or not that, re- that discipleship is relational, verbal, and behavioral. So let's talk about those quickly. What does it mean relationally to be a disciple of Jesus? Because here's the, here's the fact. Being with Jesus is the heart of Christian discipleship. Being with Jesus is the heart of Christian discipleship. This means to claim to be a disciple, to, but to not ever be with Jesus is to actually say, I'm not a disciple. What does it mean to be with Jesus? It it can mean a a wide range of things, but it it definitely is definitely not less than time in Scripture, time in prayer, time in church services, time in fellowships, and things like that. The call to discipleship is a call to be with Jesus. That's what we're doing today. We're not being necessarily first with each other, We're being with Jesus. Why is this time so important? Because it's time with Jesus. So I ask you, are you really a follower? Would your time in Scripture this week? Would your time in Scripture? Would your time in prayer? Would your time in fellowship in the church family? Would your time involvement on Sunday nights, midweek groups, morning groups today would that indicate that you have prioritized being with Jesus? There's a relational component here. There's also a verbal component. Did you see it in the text? He said there in verse number 14 that they should be with him that he might send them forth to preach. And maybe you're sitting here going, oh, I'm not a preacher. Nope, not a preacher. I've got bad news for you. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Every Christian is preaching something. We're just often not using words. We are preaching something, but the call to being a follower of Jesus is a verbal call. And here's what it is. It's speaking Jesus' message. Speaking Jesus' message is a primary action of discipleship. You may not have the call of pastoring or you may not have the call of preaching publicly like I do, but as a disciple of Jesus, you are commanded to speak His truth. You must speak it. You have to speak it. And here's the, listen very carefully. Here's the progression. Do you remember when the apostles were arrested after the ascension in the book of Acts? Do you remember when they preached and they were proclaiming that we must we must speak the things that we have seen and heard? And the unbelieving Jew, Jewish leadership, they looked at the disciples, the apostles, and they said, we can tell that they had been with Jesus. Because when you are with Jesus, you will speak about Jesus. So if you want to be a disciple and you say, but I just want to be with Jesus, but don't ask me to say anything. Boy, if you're going to be with Jesus, you're going to talk like Jesus. And here's the other implication of this. Tomorrow I'll get to spend time with my dad. I'm going to tell you right now, my dad had stepped up here before I did and he preached and then I preached. You'd look at me and you'd say, that guy's a lot like his dad. Which I'd say, I don't know, I'm a little more handsome, I'm a little happier, I'm a little... When we are with someone, we are influenced by someone and we speak about and like someone. I want to ask you this morning, when was the last time that you took the very, very powerful Word of God and you shared it with them? Friends, church family, followers of Jesus, let us not be shy with Scripture. Let us not be shy with Scripture. We speak it. We speak it. We speak it. We pray it. We pray it. We pray it. We share it. We share it. We share it. Lastly, number three, 
here, the third part is behavioral. Now listen very carefully here. I'm going to tie it all up, and some of you all look like you're freezing, so I'll finish up fast, okay? Jesus gave them power in verse 14 to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. He gave them this power. The primary intent of this for us is to realize the power that God has given us in prayer. But namely, here's the point. God has called us as disciples of Jesus. He has called us to stand against and confront the demonic and evil powers of this world. Maybe you liked the idea of being with Jesus and you liked the idea of being speaking about Jesus. But listen to me, my friends. Listen very carefully. And happy Mother's Day, but I need you to hear me, okay? The darkness and the evil of this world is all around us. This is a troubled, troubled world. It's come to our front door. Listen, it has come to our front door with the sexual and gender revolution. Listen very carefully. The question for the disciples of Jesus, and I hope, listen, you hear this, is are you ready to behave like Jesus with the message of Jesus because you have been with Jesus? The disciples were called to be warriors with Christ. I understand why we say we're going to do this for Jesus. But you know, the Christian is called to not just do it for Jesus, to do things with Jesus. And the test of true discipleship is in front of us today. It really is. It's in front of us. Are we going to bow? Are we going to bow to the idols of Babylon? of Nebuchadnezzar, to Herod, to the depravity of this world? Or are we as God's people, as the disciples and followers of Jesus, are we going to be with Jesus, speak about Jesus, and behave in a way that confronts the darkness with Jesus? That's the part that many of us are scared about. Some of us are a little better with conflict. We're looking for it. Some don't like conflict. But the question is in front of us. Are we going to behave like followers of Jesus? Parents, you must determine. And by the way, if you have young children, it doesn't start when they get to a certain age. It starts today. You must determine as a follower of Jesus if there are some shows, there are some environments, there are some friendships, and so on and so on and so forth, that your friends, that your children, that your family will not participate. You ought to determine that. As a follower of Jesus, there's a behavior that is becoming with us. And it shows that we have been with Jesus. And it shows that we prioritize Jesus' message over the message of a culture or anybody else. I ask you today, this morning as we conclude. Is Christian discipleship the highest priority of your life? Is Christian discipleship the highest priority of your life? If not, why not? Why not? I don't ask that in any shameful, condemning way. I invite you to answer, why not? Because there is nothing like being with Jesus. There is nothing like speaking about Jesus. And there will be nothing like living unto Jesus as we confront the darkness of this country. You say, well, how do you plan to confront the darkness, Pastor? By speaking the message of Jesus. And I hope I will do it, and I hope you will, with the spirit and the heart of Jesus. But that's what Christian disciples do. Christ our King. Christ our King has waged war against Satan and his army of demons. It's been going on since the Garden of Eden because Satan, Satan hates Jesus. And I'll say it to you again, Satan hates us. You, me, he hates us. But he's a loser. 
and he knows it. The only reason that we can be with Jesus and speak the message of Jesus and behave in a way that truly confronts the darkness of this world with Jesus, the only reason we can is because Jesus went to the cross and the powers of darkness tried to defeat our warrior king and Jesus won. He won. And so when we do life with Jesus, we win. We win. Please don't go out of here and be nasty because that's not the heart of Jesus. Please don't be unkind. That's not the heart of Jesus. But please do go out and let us be disciples of Jesus. Stand firm in the gospel. Don't wait because Christ our King has returned. And rejoice.